We've been involved with FAN for upwards of 20 years in some regard, working on uh, volunteering for the board or uh, volunteering in some other capacity. And so currently I'm doing that as chair of the friendly transportation team. Um, the team is uh, one of several teams that the FAN has that are basically pods of um, neighbors volunteering to focus on specific issues uh, to support and report back to the board um, on, cr on critical key um, priority issues in the neighborhood. So transportation has been a longstanding one of those. I'm putting in the chat right now, well, we do have our own web page in the friendly uh, website. Uh, you can navigate to any of the teams from that website and you can go directly to the transportation team there and find a little bit more about us because I don't have time to um, talk about everything right now. But what I do say is one of the exciting things is um, we've got a really good group getting, to go, um, getting together regularly, monthly right now. Um, even through the COVID era, we've been able to uh, continue our meetings via Zoom. Uh, we hope to get back to Billy Max, which is our neighborhood watering hole, bar and grill here at uh, 19th and Jefferson, where uh, we try to make things as social and fun as possible and as, as open for everybody. But if you can tolerate another Zoom meeting, uh, please do join us monthly. Uh, right now we're meeting on the first Monday of every month at 7 p.m. Um, the schedule subject to change, but that's uh, where we are right now. Um, we revisited our kind of goals and objectives, the way we operate in the past year. And so we have a purpose and mission statement that we share out on the website now. I just wanna share with you, we've got four pillars that are guiding us uh, in terms of enhancing neighborhood livability and friendliness related to transportation. And those are uh, the four equity, health, safety, and sustainability. So when we're looking at ways that we can improve the neighborhood, particularly in regard to transportation, we're looking at it holistically in that regard and see how can we advance um, one or all four of those elements in what we do. Um, so to join us, uh, please, like I said, come to one of our monthly meetings. We have a, a Google group, uh, email distribution list. We limit the emails to just a couple key uh, reports and, and um, updates per month. So we try not to bombard uh, with emails, but you can join that group. And that's when you find out about the meetings and some other goings on uh, both in the city and the neighborhood uh, that are transportation related. And then the main thing I wanted to get across this evening, and I'm gonna go ahead and post this in the chat, is if you've seen the newsletter or received the friendly flyer electronically or navigate to the transportation webpage, um, all those will, will point towards the survey that we have up right now. And that was um, a really good introduction from, from Mel and also Lori talking about the friendly market area because uh, friendly, Park and the market area have been on our radar for a long time. I'd say at least five years, if not pushing seven or 10, the neighborhoods elevated that as one of the top priority areas in the neighborhood to city transportation staff. And we've got a lot of those uh, on board this evening. Um, so uh, thankful for all of their participation. Uh, there's obviously a lot to do across the city, across the neighborhood. We can't address each and every single problem and, and make it all perfect all at once. And the city's got limited staff time, resources and funding as well. So we're trying to engage at the neighborhood level. Where can we bring in some additional resources, maybe attract some grant funding and, and bring in some uh, volunteer uh, human effort uh, to match what the city does or um, basically uh, complement what the city can do with anything from street art projects to um, helping the city identify what types of physical projects uh, on the street or sidewalks or whatever uh, would be um, most feasible that we could do through the city or how to prioritize those city dollars. Um, so please do take that survey. The survey is not only around the, the friendly park and, and um, market area, but also Washington Park. That's over in my neighborhood. I live uh, right over here, 19th and Jefferson area. So that park's in my backyard. That's also an area that's uh, for years, um, over a decade, neighbors have been complaining about speeding, cut through uh, access uh, for um, kids and adults using the park, uh, outside traffic, all those things. So uh, those are two areas we wanna really enhance the most for our neighbors, make those park areas as safe as possible, as inviting and friendly as possible. And uh, when you take that survey, um, just know you, you can do it in 10 minutes. We say it takes 10 minutes. If you're not, familiar with some of those options we have out there. We've got uh, pictorials of, of what some of those options look like. You, you maybe slow down and, and familiarize yourself a little bit with those. Um, 
how is I going to close this out? Um, but uh, oh, you're not you're not voting unnecessarily, so don't be scared. If you like an idea and you're and you, and you say I like that, that doesn't mean we're going to build it. It takes it takes a long time. But through this survey, we're hoping to get a, um, a little bit of critical mass to show where the where the support and interest really is from more than just the people that get together. Um, you kind of the transportation nerds to get to get together on a monthly basis and, and talk about this stuff. But what's the what's the rest of the neighborhood really thinking about uh, these solutions and options and and what's going to be received and supported by the by folks. So the survey is really important. Um, we're definitely going to have it open through February and look at the results in March. If we're still getting a lot of input, we'll we'll hold it open uh, longer. Uh, but please spread the word. You can take it whether you live in Fan or, or you're outside of Fan or not even in the park areas. Um, so with that, um, yeah, I hope you get lots of uh, lots of responses. Hope to see you at one of our transportation uh, meetings or join our group. And uh, without taking up any further time, I'd actually like to kick off our first main presentation of the evening and invite Jason Miller to talk about the what, why, and where of stormwater planters. All right, I'm uh, Brian Root. I'm actually going to jump in front of Jason. Um, I'm gonna, I was supposed to follow him, but uh, as part of the presentation, you know, this is all part of the bigger project of the South Willamette project. So I was going to go with the generic kind of the big picture, and then Jason's going to go into the weeds of the planter, um, the stormwater planters. So sorry to kind of hijack the agenda a little bit, but anyways, so I'm going to uh, share my screen. Hopefully. Can you guys all see that? Yes. Thumbs up. Awesome. Okay. Yes. So um, we were brought, Jason and I were asked to come and talk about the South Willamette project. So it's Willamette Street from 23rd down to 29th and the improvements that we're doing there. And um, as some of you guys have probably seen the stormwater planters that are on the side streets. So um, again, I'm Brian Root. I'm the civil engineer with City of Eugene and the project manager. I'm seeing it through construction. Um, that's my contact information. Um, if you want to jot it down, Jason's contact information is there too. Um, his will come up later if you don't quite have time. So um, I want to say thanks again for having us. It's uh, it's an honor to kind of get to talk to you guys and give you some kind of insight to the project. So you guys are probably well aware. This is the um, kind of overview of the existing. Oops, sorry. I'm trying to get rid of these screens so I can see my notes. Uh, where did that go? There we go. That's better. I think. All right, sorry. Okay, so existing Willamette Street, as you guys know, as you drive through there, it's got a lot of bumps and dips in it. We got the failing concrete roadway. Um, on top of that, you're seeing a lot of the um, utility work that comes in front of construction projects. So eWeb's putting in a new crossing for water lines, Northwest Natural's in there putting in some new lines for gas. So all that is what we're experiencing when we drive through Willamette. And as part of that, you know, um, just the failing concrete in general really sparked that this project needed to happen, you know, um, through the whole city's efforts of passing these bond measures, we are able to uh, accumulate some of that money as well as taking money or getting money through federal aid grants. So this did become a federal aid project, which adds some complexities, but it's really helpful because now we get to make this really vibrant um, end product. So as you guys know, we had changed the lane configuration a few years ago um, from the four through lanes to now you experience two through lanes and then that center um, turn lane with two bike lanes on the outside. So now bikes have a dedicated space to be. Um, there right now, all we've got are vehicle uh, illuminations. So the lighting's um, not really what we would like to see in a vibrant corridor. Um, on top of that, we've got stormwater. As you guys probably know, you drive through there after a rainstorm and there's puddles everywhere and street corners that are getting flooded. So those are things we're trying to, um, we're trying to, we're we will be addressing with this project. So on top of that, for the pedestrians, we're seeing narrow sidewalks. Um, some of the sidewalk areas are maybe a little bit wider, but you've got stuff in the way, power poles, um, different landscape um, pieces of you know, people's vegetation or some of their little brick walls. So we're gonna make a, 
um, work towards a, a wider sidewalk for them. And then as in the sidewalk, a lot of these driveways that come in are sloped all the way across the sidewalk. So it's steep and it's unsafe for um, people walking, wheelchairs, um, you know, all the like. So this is just an artist's representation of what we are gonna be building or we are in the middle of. So as you can see, we're really trying to make this a vibrant corridor. Um, we wanna make an experience that brings people to this part of Willamette Street, um, kind of like it was back in the day. So uh, the big one, street repaving, making it smooth and comfortable, restriping. By restriping, I just mean new striping. At this point, we're gonna stick with the same lane configuration that you see out there right now. Um, it's gonna, we're gonna be improving the accessibility to businesses and to all modes of transportation. So walk, bike, vehicles, um, people with any kind of uh, mobility issues, uh, transit. So all of those things we're trying to, we're gonna be increasing and making that safer. Um, on top of that, we're gonna be adding some lighting just for pedestrians. So we'll have pedestrian scale lighting is what we like to call it in addition to adding better illumination to the vehicles. So overall, just real good um, lighting increase. And then the stormwater treatment, that's something that Jason will talk about more, but you know, getting that water off the road, getting it into a system that helps clean the water and ultimately clean you know, our, where it goes down to the Amazon Creek and then ultimately the Willamette. So really trying to make it safer and then also treating it as well. And then on top of that, the last thing is updating um, some traffic signals that are outdated that just may need to come up to the current standards. So overall, a really big project. Um, it's been a lot of fun to be working on it. And it's, again, thanks to uh, the public for the bond measure. And then again, the, um, the hard work to get the grants from the Federal Highway Administration. So here, um, I just want to kind of get an example of one intersection that we've worked on. And to kind of give you a before and after of what we're going to see. So right now you see, you know, the roadway condition again, um, you've got all the utilities, you've got the concrete that's failing. Um, <clears throat> from there, I, we talk about the accessibility and safety. So right now um, we've got these, um, we like to call them access ramps or sidewalk ramps at the intersections. Right now we've got the, um, we call them truncated dome. So it's a detectable warning system for somebody who might be sight impaired. And right now, if you were to hit this with, um, if you were a cane user, it would actually direct you out this direction when they feel that. So we want to we want to eliminate that. We want to help direct people to stay within the crosswalk where it's safe. So that's one of the things we're going to be um, making uh, better. On top of that, you can see, you know, this is um, you know pretty wide side street. So if you were crossing, you're going to be crossing this whole distance. And I'll show you later on the next slide, but we want to decrease that crossing distance. So that's, you know, that's a conflict zone. That's somewhere that somebody can get hit or a cyclist can get hit. So we want to decrease that distance that you are out there where you are vulnerable to the vehicle. And then on top of that, we're going to be, you know, the stormwater system you're going to see. We've got just a little bit of these storm drains in the corners. You know, there's water coming down this hill can bypass, or if this gets clogged with leaves, it comes out in the road and we all drive through it. It's a big splash and, you know, it's just, it's a safety concern on top of just, we wanna make sure we can treat that and uh, make it a, uh, just a better corridor in general. So here's the plans, right? I don't have a, an after picture yet, but it'll be coming soon. So what I've shown here is you can see some red and green. The red is your existing curb line. So that's what we just looked at. It's back here. But you can see our proposed, which are these black ones, they come out further. So this crossing distance is now, you know, we've removed about 10 feet and it's making it so that vehicles are going to be coming up and we're going to, it helps the vehicles slow down when they make these, these turns. Um, all this stuff has been calculated and gone through simulation to make sure that this is a turning movement that, it, that works for vehicles. If a if the cars over here stage facing west, this right turn to go eastbound is still going to work um, work well. But it's a we intentionally want to slow vehicles down so that they are more cognizant of a pedestrian that's at this corner ready to cross or a bike coming. If it's a, a large sweeping uh, corner, they tend to take that much quicker, and they they don't have to take the time as often to look for 
a pedestrian or a cyclist. So that's part of that, um, why you see some of these bump outs out here as well. It's just all about safety. Um, so the green line, I wanted to show this one specifically. This is gonna be one of our new planters. Again, Jason will talk about that. But this is where water's coming down 25th down the hill. It's getting into this storm drain system here. It's going underground and then it's gonna come into this stormwater planter and get uh, treated. So we're gonna be cleaning that water. Part of the reason I wanted to show this one is what you're seeing out there right now when you drive is the red and the green. So when you make this corner, you're seeing this planter sticking out in the roadway and it's caused some, some concern and valid concern. Um, but I just wanna reiterate that when we are done, this will be all smooth in this transition. You won't even really notice this planter anymore other than how good it's gonna look when it's planted. Um, all the plants in here are gonna make it look like a really nice landscaped area. So we've temporarily, we've put out some barricades to try to highlight this area, but I just kind of wanted to bring that up just so you can see kind of what you're experiencing right now when you're out, out uh, driving around and that it is temporary. Um, yeah, I talked about the safety, the decreased crossing distance, and the slower movement. So that's that. So that's 25th. So earlier I talked about the sidewalks. So in addition to redoing the whole roadway and putting in a nice 14-inch structure of concrete that's going to last us a really long time, we're going out and we're redoing all the sidewalks and the driveways. So this, um, this is down here by Woodfield Station. Uh, looking north, you can see, you know, this has got about an eight foot wide area, but you've got these landscape bricks that are out exposing and that are a tripping hazard and narrowing our sidewalk. So that's something that we want to get rid of that narrow sidewalk. Up here, you see it again as vegetation. Um, and then here, what you're seeing is as you're walking on this, this sidewalk that's relatively flat, all of a sudden you come into this driveway approach that's, you know, 12, 15, 17 percent that's steep, that's uncomfortable to walk on. And as well as somebody in a, a wheelchair, that actually will cause them to almost turn into the roadway. So without holding your left side kind of firm as you're trying to rotate your right wheel at a different speed, that makes it really hard to travel. So that's something that we will see in the next slide. Um, we wanna give a safe passage for all modes on the sidewalk. So here's uh, some of that work in the same area. Now we're looking south, obviously, but um, you can see the new sidewalk has got this full eight feet separating kind of the, we kind of cut it in half more or less. We've got this front zone that we call the furnishing zone. So this is where you're gonna see more of your obstacles that um, like trees, um, the pedestrian scale lighting, things that you, that you um, if you have issues with accessibility, you wouldn't want to have to go around. So in that area, we've got, or in this back five feet, we've got the designated walk area, the area that's going to be free of hazards that you can go through uh, safely. So then back here, you can see, here's the driveway apron in that first three and a half feet. And then we've got a nice flat spot to go through with a wheelchair and walking. Um, so much easier uh, way to travel north and south on Willamette. And again, we've got new curb and gutter, and then our roadway, of course, will be finished as well. So that moves me kind of just into the construction schedule. I know that's probably a, um, a big question out there. So right now, we've um, this project's gotten into a split construction. So un unfortunately, we don't really like to do the split construction, but we had some hiccups with the some of the guidelines that follow with federal money um, that pushed us back later in the summer for a start. So that's kind of where, why we've got the split construction. But what you guys will experience starting in March is um, we're gonna be back out there down towards the south, kind of in the Woodfield Station 28th area. And we'll be working on the east side. And we're gonna be doing the sidewalks, all the sidewalk work, all the electrical work and tree work in there. And then moving out and doing this first kind of third of the roadway. So this whole east side, as we've been calling it, we will work from south to north, all the way from where we've ended last year, all the way up to 23rd. Then since we're up there with the equipment, we'll switch 
um, likely to the center. It could be that we switch over to the west side. I'm still working on with our contractor Wildish on that, um, which I think I'll show you in the next slide why. But we will be switching to another third of the project, whether it's the center lane or the west, we will work from north, the north up by 23rd, back down to 29th and be repaving all that. Then once we get down to the south end, turn around and then work our way back north with that last third of the conch or the roadway paving and then all the sidewalk work on that west side. So that is expected to go through 2021. Um, it, it's going to be a, you know, I'll be honest, it's going to be a long summer, but we're going to be working hard. Um, I had a meeting earlier this week with Wildish um, talking about the schedule and that, you know, they're going to be throwing a lot of the resources as much as they can out there to get this done quickly, efficiently, um, and do a really good, a really good end product. Wildish does really good work. So we're happy to partner with them on that. And with that, I'll give it to Jason. Let me interrupt one second because we never talked about um, how to do questions. Because we have two screens of folks, it'll be too hard to see hand raises. So um, if you're going to have questions, which we were going to wait until after both of these pieces were done, if you could write them in the chat um, and then we will get a cue and, and read the questions. And if we need further information from you, we'll ask you to uh, clarify. So chat's down at the bottom. Thank you. All right, Jason. Excellent. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. Um, first of all, I really appreciate um, the invitation to come out and talk about the rain gardens. And uh, really it's been a big effort on a wide variety of our um, team to make this all come together between Brian's work, the swim and stormwater team, as well as our um, urban forestry staff. So um, again, my name is Jason Miller. I am a landscape architect in the public works and engineering department. And uh, this presentation is gonna cover the Willamette Street uh, landscape and stormwater improvements. So the agenda uh, for the presentation, so we're gonna look at the pre-project history a little bit about, um, we're gonna go into detail on why the stormwater treatment was required. We'll also talk about how rain gardens were selected. We'll talk about the design and implementation, kind of open up the curtain about how, how we got to where we're at. And then we'll also talk about staging, phasing, planting, kind of where we're, we are now and where we're headed. And then we'll follow up with the questions and answers at the end. So um, my role in, in engineering, I work on a multitude of projects, including stormwater, uh, median and street improvements, as well as park improvements. And um, I really partnered in working with um, Brian and our other engineers on this project to really look at the stormwater treatment for the uh, for Willamette Street. So. This is kind of just a reiteration of the project goals that we had and uh, my role was obviously more focused on the bioretention and stormwater. So this, this is an image uh, from epa.gov uh, about green streets. And I think what's really important about this image is um, all of the green arrows that are shown here are features that are included in the Willamette Street improvements. And so these are items that we've, we've thought about, we've integrated and they're going to be um, really, you know, moving Willamette Street from um, what it is now into something really great or something much significantly improved. And so, you know, we looked at uh, the soil volume for the street trees, uh, the soil vol volume in relation to being able to get mature street trees onto this project site, um, compost amendments, we'll look at recycled materials, which is also ties into what we did um, in the actual rain gardens themselves. And then bioretention was obviously a, a focus um, of Willamette Street that, that is a part of this. So a good green street will protect water quality in streams and rivers. It'll filter out 90% of pollutants. It'll also replenish and recharge groundwater, absorb carbon, improve air quality and improve aesthetics. 
So um, Willamette Street needed to be significantly improved um, as is shown in the pictures on this slide. I mean, um, this project is an opportunity to ensure that the corridor is more inviting, pedestrian friendly and environmentally sustainable, aligning the street with both the project goals and the principles of a green street. So as you can see in the top left, I mean, as, as Brian talked about, it's pretty unsafe for pedestrians. We've also got a lot of storm water that's being thrown into the pedestrian areas that needed to be treated. We've got a lot of impervious pavement that, that um, on this project and all of that um, is headed towards uh, Amazon Creek. And so the runoff that's coming, um, you know, we got runoff with pet and human waste. We got a lot of sediment, we got heavy metals um, from the brake pads, you know, tire zinc from the tires, um, gasoline, motor oil, petroleum, all of that is just going straight into Amazon, as you can see in the picture in the bottom left here. So as, as I said, the street trees are, are a part of the stormwater improvements along Willamette Street. I just wanted to talk about them very briefly here, but um, the trees will add character and make the corridor more inviting for pedestrians. They are in that furnishing zone as Brian described. And the, you know, the trees were appropriately sized based on the soil volume with careful considerations regarding the science of the trees taken into consideration so that they can thrive in this very difficult urban environment. So a large area of the root zones were carved out of the right of way to provide soil volume that, that will sustain them for many years. And these are some construction photos from the work that was performed down at 29th and Willamette Street. And um, as you can see here, the, this is the soil cells being installed and they're essentially supporting the paving on top of them. And then just below that, or um, in this picture, you can see the tree um, the soil cells have been filled up with amended soil that's actually going to uh, provide a, a ton of nutrients and moisture for the trees to thrive. The photograph here on the right shows the paving being put in over the top of that, um, the soil cells. And then the bottom left shows the, you know, the home of the tree in that uh, site furnishing zone with the five foot accessible um, outside of that. Science has really showed us that the more volume we can give a tree, the better and healthier it, be, it becomes. And so that's why that's integrated into this design um, as much uh, or, or so that the trees will aid in stormwater treatment, reducing the amount of water reaching the pavement. So the existing stormwater, uh, Brian talked a little bit about it. Um, all, a lot of the water which generated the flooding on Willamette Street was from the hills along the west side of the street. And in many cases, attempts, you know, had been made to reduce flooding by using a system of bubblers in which water was captured and piped underneath the street and allowed to bubble on the east side. But the, in the attached image really shows one example. Um, you can see the water coming down the hillside. It's being captured by this inlet and it's bubbling up on the east side, but it's also bubbling up right in the middle of an ADA ramp, which would be very difficult to use during a rain event. So this picture um, illustrates more of the amount of flooding and the volume of stormwater that, that, that was being discharged onto Willamette Street from the west, as well as the, the water hitting Willamette Street itself. There's simply no way for a pedestrian to walk this without getting soaked. You know, when our storm lines are full and to capacity and during a rain event. And so how can we look at that? And that, that really got us to, um, this is kind of our early on diagram where we were, we were looking at Willamette Street and, and storm water treatment. And this diagram, you know, illustrates the amount of impervious area running onto Willamette Street. And that, believe it or not, there are a couple of little tiny green strips in here but generally um, there's a lot of impervious surface. And what that means is as soon as a water drop hits, the very first place it's going is to the inlet and then straight into Amazon Creek. And it just shows that, you know, the amount of water that was not being treated with all of the zinc and the buildup of materials and how quickly it was just being discharged into the local stream. So why was stormwater treatment needed? It's needed for the clean water for the streams and rivers, um, for to solve flooding problems like the ones that were shown in the previous pictures. 
to add hydraulic capacity. And, and what that means is as a raindrop hits the surface, if it immediately goes into an inlet, it fills up our system really quickly and then uh, discharges downstream really quickly. And what, um, by using stormwater treatment, we can slow that rain drop, that drop of water from getting into the system so quickly, increasing our capacity for the system. And as you can imagine, when that one raindrop hits the, the storm system and all of it hits at once, essentially it's a lot of water, a lot of force, and it creates modifications downstream that are negative for the erosion control. Um, one great example of this is on my commute to work, I ride under um, chambers and it doesn't take a very large event for Amazon Creek to immediately go into flooding that area. So why, why was it required on this project? Because of the Clean Water Act and our Eugene MPDES MS4 permitting um, for the Safe Drinking Water Act and then the reconstruction of the roadway. And that was a significant trigger for the stormwater. Um, essentially when we took the road back down to the subgrade, like we're going to, it, it's you're rebuilding the road. It's no longer a maintenance project. And so that triggered a lot of the flow control requirements that are tied to the stormwater. And then the, we also needed to perform treatment to meet the federal state funding requirements. And of course, to comply with our stormwater manual, which, which we do on almost all improvements. So this, this was during the early phases. So many options were reviewed during the conceptual design of the project. And one item that was, that was a possible option for us stormwater treatment wise was a dry pond. And this, this proved to be you know, too costly in the end due to the amount of distance, piping and depth that would be required to provide treatment. Um, you know, here are some areas that were discussed during the design process, but were not sufficient enough to provide treatment. So what you're really looking for there is a large enough piece of property or area that is, you know, would be owned by the city that in which we could create a really large facility and then essentially take all of that stormwater from Willamette Street down to that facility, provide treatment and then re-release it with 90% pollutants gone uh, down to the river. And um, the picture on the, the left shows Ferndale Park in, in Northwest Eugene, in which we were able to do that. And that was a very effective form of treatment. But in this case, with the federally protected plants, the amount of wetlands and the limited space because of the urbanization, it was really tough to find a location in which we could do that. So another viable option that we looked at in this process was um, trying to treat a, a similar street um, within the same watershed. So we're still providing that pollution level of treatment in the watershed that, that would be um, typically done for Willamette Street. But, but we were doing, looking at doing it on Amazon Parkway. And Amazon Parkway, of course, is right next to Amazon Creek. But what we found is that, you know, in the requirements that with ODOT, that a lot of the levels of pollution was determined largely by the traffic count. And unfortunately, we were just never able to find an adequate substitution for the amount of cars and pollution that's on Willamette Street with the amount of cars and pollution that are, is on Amazon Parkway. So it was not, not a viable alternative. So after kind of looking at those big picture items, um, you know, we went back to this, this is the diagram again of all the area that's not being treated uh, along Willamette Street and, and thought about how can we think about this and, and look at, a, a, you know, how can it become more, it essentially became more apparent that the most reasonable cost to benefit ratio to provide treatment was closer to the source. And so, it, you know, this is a, a more breakdown study here in which the areas of treatment identified you know, could include the side streets, it could expand the overall treatment in the watershed and really maximize the amount of treatment along the street. And so the water along the west edge would, you know, would, would still potentially bubble across, but we could catch a lot of it um, by, by providing treatment on the side streets. And so uh, additional, you know, what we realized is how much of this map we could turn to green 
by simply using some more localized um, form of treatment. There were areas that we could just never, we were never gonna be able to achieve. Either they would create, you know, a facility that would be so tiny or it just was, um, you know, wasn't feasible to do so. But we felt like it was a fairly equal, it was actually a more than equal substitution for us to treat um, the side streets in addition to the, to the primary street of Willamette. And so we ended up with a net zero change. We were able to treat 100% of Willamette Street by using the trade-off between the side streets and because we were capturing you know, water that had such a high pollution level from the West. And so um, you know, potential locations were identified on the side streets really to maximize the amount of treatment area and to locate the treated facilities in a position that would allow better access for maintenance staff, and most importantly, accommodate the proposed trees for Willamette Street. So by, by putting the mature street trees on Willamette Street and the, the, the treatment facilities on the side streets, we were um, you know, able to, to treat and, and provide shade and do um, you know, really focus in on our goals that were intended for the project. So based on the limited space available to provide for treatment, uh, the best option uh, that was determined was to be filtration planters. And so they, um, the poorly drained soil, so we have these real heavy, heavily compacted clay soils that uh, essentially, you know, drain poorly. And so we needed a, uh, with our, our, we needed to be able to filter water and remove the pollutants quicker than what the soils would allow. And so this is an enlargement of one of the watersheds. And I just wanted to really point out here, you know, we're able to treat an entire block here as well as the side street. And, and you can see in, in sizing these facilities, we're really looking at, at, you know, getting the maximum amount of facility for the stormwater treatment, but um, minimizing their, their overall size and spatial dimensions. And that's really, you can see like here, we're, we needed 1,070 square foot of treatment and we provided 1,070. So really thinking about how those can fit into, you know, such an urban streetscape without, um, you know, taking up so much area that it's extremely intrusive to everyone. And so the sizing of the planters is also consistent with both our stormwater manual and the ODOT requirements, minimum requirements. This is the actual detail that's being constructed on site. Um, what you can really see here is that, you know, as the raindrop comes into the planter, it's filtered through this 18 inches of media. So between the media and the plants that are in there, it's going to remove 90% of the pollutants. And then we've got contact with the subgrade so we can be allowing water to do groundwater recharge. And then at this point, once it reaches here, and then if the water table is high or, or this is filled to capacity, then we can discharge it back into the storm system kind of at a later time so that we're not putting all that water into the piping system right as the storm event happens. So some of the features of the rain gardens that we included here are, um, you know, we have recycled concrete from Willamette Road. Um, we thought this was a great opportunity. We have a lot of concrete and, you know, how can we reuse this without, you know, divert the material from going straight to the landfill. And so um, we found, found opportunities to do that in the design of the planters by using them in, as weirs to transition kind of between each bay. And this really reduced the amount of landfill waste and aesthetically will blend you know, well with the proposed planting design and surroundings. This is a pretty typical, you know, construction in the, in the Pacific Northwest of just finding ways to reuse existing materials and uh, integrating them into the overall design. The other thing I want to point out in the planters is at each one of the openings is kind of a large square box. That's essentially a modified inlet. And what that allows us to do is to catch a lot of sediment and large debris before it actually gets into the planters. Um, what this does is um, reduces the amount of maintenance that the city needs to do on, on an annual basis. So um, instead of having to come out and shovel and, and remove all of the sediment, 
you know, after a certain number of storm events, we're able to capture a lot more of it with these structures. And this is seen as more durable long-term solution. We can also get it on a cycle where our maintenance staff can come in and remove the sediment and, and, and clean these on a regular basis. So it's a win-win for everyone maintaining the facility. So um, this image illustrates the overflow drains that you see in the planters. The idea is the raindrop comes into the from the modified inlet, it fills up each bay. As each bay fills up, um, eventually it'll get to the end of the planter and there is an emergency overflow in the planter and that was to reduce the localized flooding. And so once we've captured the, the amount of rain determined for the, for you know 90% of the rain events that we have will be captured by the facility as it is now and allow it to soak into the ground. Um, but if, if during a really large event, we wouldn't have localized flooding because we would have these emergency overflows. And you can see in this bottom left picture here, in this case, this one doesn't have an emergency overflow, but it is linked to another planter down further down the line that does have an emergency overflow. So as it fills up, um, we would treat all this water and then the extra water would, would move on down to that final planter through the gutter bar. So here are some images of the planter construction. I'm sure you're pretty familiar um, just by observing them at this point, but you know, once the weirs are set and the soil is leveled and the area is prepared for planting, um, you know, the, these are, are really effective for, for what we're trying to do. So um, currently I'm finalizing the planting design proposed for the planters and the goal is to plant all planters, you know, before the end of spring. And the photograph above kind of illustrates what the planters appear to look like the first year. As you can really see the plants will go in and it'll appear kind of small. But here we are, you know, year two, we've got, you know, lots of growth, plants are coming in and really thriving. And so it's not gonna take us long to get these to look really nice. It's just, it, we just need to buy a little bit of time to get the, you know, get the plants in there and get them and take care of them. And um, the plants, you know, chosen will be durable and visually will complement, you know, the structures themselves. And they will be small in size and, and have seasonal you know, appropriateness to them. You know, they, the planters will be planted and aerated to prolong the health of the facility. Um, it's not, we, we aerate all these facilities um, after we do the planting. And this really, you know, plants will be cared for and maintained by the landscape contractor for the first two years to establish the planters. And then they will be maintained by city staff. And so, Year one, we're doing you know very frequent watering and, and taking care of the plants. Year two, we start to spread that out so the plants can adjust more to our climate. And by year three, these are proven to be pretty much self-sustainable, other than okay, the, the quarterly removal of you know leaves, debris, and um, sediment buildup. So the planters do have a life cycle to them. Essentially, we're building a box in which we can put, um, you know, soil media and plants in that box, and and then take out 90% of our pollutants that are coming off of the street. And and because they do have a cycle, we recognize that um, that you know right now we're estimating about a 15-year cycle will result in the need for replacement of the media and the and the uh, plants. And so that's why a lot of these facilities don't have, you know, really large trees and those kinds of things in there because they will need to be replaced as pollutants build up. You know, some facilities do thrive longer and some shorter. It really depends on the amount of pollution that's being put into the planters. And then uh, I just want to say that, you know, the benefits of treatment using this method are, are really truly amazing. I mean, Study after study has shown that you know we're removing an average of 25 to 50 percent of our phosphorus coming into these. The media and the plants are taking out 40 to 60 percent of nitrogen. They're also you know we have runoff reduction of 40 to 80 percent for areas treated with planters, and they can really handle 90 percent of our storm events without you know needing an overflow. So I think that's pretty amazing for such a small facility. Um, to be able to treat such a large area on Willamette Street. 
So the planters are in the middle of being constructed. You know, patience uh, is needed to allow us to kind of get them online, get them operating. And, you know, as with any project, you know, it is a process. We're invested in this process and are confident that these will become amenities to the community over time. And with that, I would um, just open it up for questions. All right, we have two questions in the chat. So remember that if you have a question, um, add it to the chat. Um, the first question is from Billy and his is busy driveways to parking lots are a dangerous part of any sidewalk system. Other than the sloping and landscape trip hazards you mentioned, are there any plans to make improvements that will make drivers more aware of the sidewalk as they approach it from within a parking lot, such as a bump or a change in pavement or elevation? It's a really good question. Um, to my understanding of the project as I've taken it over, there will not be um, any bumps added um, to kind of give a warning to the the vehicles. Um, we did, when we put driveways back in, uh, I believe um, from what I heard from my last predecessor, you know, sizing the driveways appropriately and then the amount of driveways and how close they are to say an intersection, a lot of that went into the design. So you will see some kind of minor changes to the driveways as you, as the corridor gets rebuilt, but um, nothing that would essentially alert a driver that they're about to cross a sidewalk. But no, oh, good question, thank you. Um, another one, actually two from Beth. So the first one was, wouldn't permeable sidewalks be super classy looking in addition to being ecological? What were the thoughts behind not including this feature from the EPA government list? That's another good one. Um, I'll do my best to answer this one again, and I, I really don't wanna uh, sound like I, um, I'm just trying to point fingers and anything, but not being part of the design, um, I'm not 100% sure why we wouldn't do that other than I know there's a maintenance issue with that as permeable, um, we start getting, seeing sediment build up in there. And you know when you do a permeable concrete in the street, in the roadway, we've done that over, I think in the river road area and had good success, but that's getting swept by uh, street sweepers and getting some maintenance to it. In a sidewalk, you don't see that. But um, again, that's a really good question. I don't have a really solid answer for you, I'm sorry. Another one is, I'm curious about why a few stormwater planters weren't placed west of Willamette to catch some of that downhill water before it reaches Willamette, and perhaps it would have reduced the total number needed east of Willamette. I can answer that, Brian. Perfect. Um, so as a part of our, our partnering with ODOT on this project, um, our, our requirement to treat the stormwater was really only the raindrops that land on Willamette Street. And so um, we wanted to ensure that we were treating that, but all of this extra overland flow that was kind of pouring onto Willamette Street, that, that we were technically not required to treat those. And so um, what, what would have ensued is that we would have a, had to have a much larger facility to start treating the overland flow as well as the water on Willamette Street. I think we, we did a real compromise by being able to use the side streets. We're still picking up some of the water coming from west to east um, as a part of that. But for us to kind of build infrastructure on the west side um, wasn't really part of the focus on treating the water that was landing on Willamette Street. That's a great question. Um, next up is where does the soil from the planters go after the 15 year lifespan span of the planter? I, I think that's another really good question. I mean, we've had um, most of our facilities are just kind of now getting to this age requirement and we honestly haven't had to do a lot of the renovation of those. Um, we've really been following Portland and Seattle's lead in terms of that. And um, I, I think it really depends on the level of contamination, right? If it's severely contaminated, then it's most likely gonna end up in some type of, of landfill um, in, in some shape or form. 
ethyl metal concentration is so high. I do know that we, you know, we're looking at doing testing and things to just see how contaminating the media is getting and how quickly it's getting there. But we honestly haven't started a cycle of really replacing these yet to a level to we know exactly, you know, where we would be sending them elsewhere otherwise. Uh, next question, are there new requirements for building developers to include stormwater planters in their new projects? For example, the triplex um, at the corner of 24th and Willamette, the builder, um, oh goodness, uh, the builder said they were required for all new building projects. Are you using native plants? Part two. So, I mean, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of park projects as well. And every project that we do is subject to our stormwater manual. And it, you know, anything that exceeds the, the limitations uh, for the improvement is gonna result in the need to perform stormwater treatment. So um, I, I think that's just kind of standard practice with any improvement. Um, these, you know, again, these are more for treating public infrastructure and they're not designed to be treating private infrastructure. And so like each each site would be treated on its on its own basis. And then um, the other question was in regard to native plants. So, so the interesting thing about the plants is that um, there are a lot of different plants that can be chosen for a project like this. Um, what we tend to lean on, you know, we've tried and tested some different plants uh, we do like native plants, but not all native plants can perform to the level that we need them to. We need a plant that, you know, ideally in this condition, it's going to have more of a horizontal root condition, and it's going to be more, um, it's going to be able to handle severe inundation, and then these really prolonged periods of dry, dry areas. And it's almost the plants that if you were to drive in North Eugene, like out in the farmland, you'd see in the ditches. And so that's why a lot of the um, what we call zone A plants because uh, for inundation come from, and we, we do try to use as many natives as we can, but some of them we're not able to get locally available. And then, um, but we're, you know, the native, some native plants are designed to handle this, but it is a very extreme condition that not all natives can handle. Right, one more from Beth. Um, I have a neighbor who is concerned about the effect of increased illumination on Willamette. Is there a way for individual residents to give input on the location of specific light fixtures? For example, if the light is going to shine right into someone's home in a way that bothers them. And, and it, it, in addition to this, I know when we were first told about this uh, reconstruction, there was conversation about involving uh, residents and neighbors to the area to be involved in the, I, I don't know, the beautification part of it, which lighting I know was part of that. So whether that's gonna be, con gonna be continued or um, decisions are made. So yeah, um, <clears throat> moving forward as we're putting in the new head fixtures for the, the vehicle uh, lighting and then the, the lights we're gonna be using are gonna be LEDs. And so with the LEDs, we can actually aim them in a direction that they only are shining kind of up and down the roadway versus more of a, instead of a 360 array, we can actually aim them kind of more of a 180 degree. So it just goes north and south. Um, and then in addition, as we're putting those in, we, we watch the lighting, we look at it at night and we can, we can install shields to that that help basically create a shadow for a home so that we're still getting a good amount of light on the roadway, but it doesn't spread out into a residence area. And then the pedestrian lighting, that's going to be um, a shorter. It's not going to be up at the 30 feet like you see right now. It's going to be down at 16 feet, and it's a very direct just on the sidewalk. And those will be LED as well. So those are something that we can give a direction to it. And um, if there are issues, um, you know, individuals can contact me, and then I work with the contractor, the subcontractor, and we see what we can do to um, eliminate those issues and, you know, take a look at it closer. What about um, involvement of neighbors with other, I don't, like I say, I, 
we know we have the lighting and the tree placement. Are there going to be other things like benches and any of that? And will neighbor neighbors be able to be involved in in those discussions? I don't know that we're going to be um, adding benches. Uh, the trees and the lights are all set right now. Um, a lot of the, the lighting itself is for spacing so that we don't get a lot of like calm hot and cold spots. So one area is really bright then all of a sudden you kind of go into a shadow and then you're back into a bright spot. So we really want to make a consistent, um, consistent lighting throughout there. So there's a very specific spacing we need to follow. And then the trees, um, Jason might have a little better idea on this one, but basically we are just trying to find the areas that will having a consistent amount of trees throughout the corridor is part, probably part of it. But then also just making sure we can find spots that the tree can thrive so that we don't have long-term issues, but we have a corridor that is self-sustaining and it looks great in the end. So I, I will say on the trees, I mean, we work closely with our urban forestry staff to, to come up with our tree selection list. And a lot of that's kind of based on availability, but we've also taken that and in, in, in Friends of Trees has been involved. Um, they've looked at our plans and provided comments. And so we have been actively engaging to get feedback on the, the trees that are gonna be installed. Unfortunately, a lot of it is based on availability and then um, you know just what what's gonna work best in that environment. We don't wanna, we can't put a really large tree in a, in a root zone that just doesn't have the soil. And so otherwise it will just be stunted. And so there are very specific parameters for the trees along the streetscape based on what's available to them. Thank you. And here's a, a suggestion. Um, when designing new street side concrete stormwater basins, perhaps adding built in reflectors. And I don't know if you want to comment on that or if. Um... Yeah, I can comment to that. Um, so some of the stuff that's going through the construction of this um, is just some lessons learned. And on top of lessons learned as far as reflectability or reflection, it's also kind of goes ties back to that split construction window that we're in. Um, a lot of these planters came in at, towards the end of the season last year. And once those were constructed and we're ready to put on reflectors and some yellow paint to help um, kind of make those more visible, it got into our rainy season. You know, we got pushed up into Thanksgiving. So unfortunately we were at a point where it wasn't, we weren't able to actually get a good product down on those, um, some of the curbs you see on the round of planters. So we've been working with our maintenance staff to help us get some temporary, um, some temporary um, items out there, basically cones and flexible markers that we can put out there temporarily to try to help um, help people see them visually until we get the permanent fix up there. Are there any other questions? That's all that's in the chat. Um, so I want to thank both of both of you, Jason and Brian, for coming. I think the PowerPoints were really helpful, at least for me, to, to actually be able to visualize what the intention will be. And, um, and uh, we will add their email addresses to the chat so folks can um, get them if they have more questions specifically for them. And I thank everyone for the great questions as well. Um, so moving on, uh, Logan Tell, tell I, I hope that's correct, is going to be speaking to us about uh, the 20 is Plenty program. Uh, Logan, are you going to have any, do you need to show any PowerPoints or just talk? I, I do not have a PowerPoint to, okay. to show, um, but yes, thank, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Logan Tellis. I'm a transportation planner with the city of Eugene. Um, so I'm gonna give some background context because some of you may be familiar with what 20, what 20 is plenty is and some of you may not. Um, so at the beginning of 2020, uh, legislative changes went into effect in the state of Oregon that gave us a little more flexibility in lowering speed limits on certain types of streets. Um, in particular, streets uh, that had an existing statutory uh, speed limit of 25 that were low, classified as local streets and, and streets uh, classified as collector streets, so we're also 25. Um, and this legislation gave us the authority to lower that statutory speed from 25 down to 20 miles per hour 
Um, so uh, with that change, um, you know, taking place at the, at the beginning of the year, uh, the transportation planning team began work on um, uh, sort of gathering information and um, gearing ourselves up to uh, consult with the city council on the subject. Um, since it would be such a, a large scale citywide project, uh, we felt like that would be appropriate in this instance. Um, as well as we pulled together, um, you know, some, some communications uh, materials to go along with the project as well. Um, so with city council's uh, approval, we move forward um, with uh, planning on implementing the speed limit changes on local streets, uh, concentrating on, on just the uh, streets that had the functional classification of local that met um, that 25 mile per hour existing statutory speed limit. Um, and the goal of the project was to swap out existing uh, speed limit signs, uh, not add new speed limit signs. And I know uh, that's been a point of frustration for some folks. You know, they hear about 20 mile per hour speed limit changes, and they think they might see a new speed limit sign on their street. Um, but unfortunately, um, you know, the cost of installing a new speed limit sign um, would have inflated at a citywide scale, would have inflated the, the, the budget of the project quite a bit, uh, digging the hole, installing the foundation, putting in the post, putting on the sign, um, in addition to you know, the, the extra maintenance costs that would have gone along with installing you know, a, a ton of additional speed limit signs uh, citywide. Um, so we move forward. Um, and it, at the end of the summer, beginning of the fall, uh, speed limit sw uh, sign swaps started taking place. Uh, we, we went for a phased approach. Um, uh, we, we went from neighborhood association to neighborhood association, making the speed limit swaps um, and completed a majority of those uh, by the end of the fall. Um, so since the, and, and, and so to back up a bit, um, in addition to those speed limit swaps, we uh, launched a pretty wide and robust uh, communications uh, plan with the, uh, with the speed limit changes themselves to help get the word out about um, what the speed limit project was, um, where people should expect to see it. Um, so I'm sure, I'm sure some of you have seen uh, our social media communications about the 20 mile per, mile per hour speed limits. Um, and additionally, we had radio advertising. Um, and I'm sure many of you have seen uh, yard signs that are the 20 is plenty uh, white and green yard signs. We ordered uh, 1400 of those. And through you know, a pretty robust uh, community outreach push, I managed to get them all out. Uh, before the end of the year, uh, we distributed those to you know, just individual residents who expressed interest. We distributed those to you know, interested neighborhood associations, to local businesses. Uh, the bike shops in particular were enthusiastic about um, helping get the word out about the speed limit reductions. Uh, we partnered with Better Eugene Springfield Transportation to distribute some of the yard signs and as well as uh, the Safe Routes to School program for 4J. Um, so several schools took uh, signs and distributed them with uh, like supply pickups that some, some schools are hosting right now for students um, and, and families. So um, since the end of the fall, there has been a little bit of activity um, sort of circling back to some locations and resolving some sort of oddities here and there. Um, the thing with this type of project uh, is that uh, in the state of Oregon, speed limit signs are posted uh, generally just where the speed zone changes itself. Uh, now this project uh, targets local, this, this project up until this point has targeted local streets. Um, and there are some locations where a local street abuts a collector street and they were both 25 mile per hour speed limits prior to the program. And so the local streets were relying on the collector streets speed limit signs to sort of de facto set the speed limit for the local street. Um, and that creates a challenge because now, now we're in sort of the position of, well, um, we, we're, not, you know, ex we're not installing new speed limit signs, but also we didn't in initially intend to change the speed limit on collector streets. Um, when we embarked on this project. Um, so what do we do in these locations? 
Um, and that kind of gears us up for the, the next, you know, 2021 iteration of, of the program where uh, the traffic operations group and the transportation planning team are going to be considering and evaluating which collector streets um, are appropriate for that reduction down to 20. Um, and that's something that um, will be an ongoing process. Um, there's not a, a concrete timeline on when those specific uh, you know, speed limit sign swaps would occur, um, but it's, it's gonna be an area of work this year, um, certainly. Um, so with all of that information uh, out, I, I think that I'm probably ready to open it up for questions. Um, well, we have one in the chat mm -hmm. um, and it says, we have been placing lots of 20 is plenty signs around our neighborhood to help raise awareness. The question, some of these signs oops, are being placed in the um, city, oh no, are placed in the planner strips in front of our houses. It's my understanding that all signs must be placed on private property. However, the signs are much more visible on city on strips next to the street. Is the city going to remove these signs if they are on city on land right next to the street? So um, in short, no, I, I, I'm not aware of any city plans to remove those. Um, you know, it's the kind of thing where like technically, you know, their yard signs intended for, for you know, private property. But uh, I also, when we embarked on this project, we also recognized that we can't stop people from putting the signs wherever they're gonna put them. Um, and there's not gonna be, you know, any kind of organized or concerted push to remo remove yard signs from, from city uh, landscaping strips. Um, so yeah. Uh, Short answer, no. <laughs> <laughs> Another one, here's a wild idea. Signs at the major entry points of the city saying, welcome to Eugene, where the default speed limit is 20 miles per hour. <laughs> yeah, that would, that would be something. Um, yeah, so, so uh, yeah, I, I appreciate the sentiment, but uh, you know, certainly not all of our streets are local streets. There are, there are a lot of locations with, that have other kinds of speed limits. And, I, I, I wouldn't want to impart the, uh, I, I'm sure this is partially maybe, um, but anywho, uh, I, I wouldn't want to impart the idea that people have to drive 20 miles per hour everywhere. I don't, I don't think many of you would appreciate that. <laughs> um, next question. What about residential streets with a speed limit higher than 25? Can the speed limit be lowered on those streets? So, um, the answer is not through this specific process that we're using for the 20s Plenty uh, project. So, so this particular um, project emerged, as I, as I explained, out of the legislative changes that allowed us to change um, speeds on from that statutory 25 down to 20 on local and collector streets. But um, conventionally, like before this process was, you know, aside from this process, there's a separate process by which uh, we can petition ODOT for a, a, a change in speed limit um, via a, a speed study, essentially. Um, and there is some interesting development taking place on that right now. Um, my understanding is there is um, a bill um, at the state legislature uh, that would um, reduce the barriers to us lowering speed limits, essentially. Because um, in the past, in the state of Oregon, it's really been oriented around that um, 85th percentile, you know, uh, the 85th percentile speed on a roadway, which is, um, you know, it's quite high. And uh, the, the uh, proposal that I've heard of um, currently would bring that down to 50th percentile, um, which is uh, a significant reduction um, and would make, a, would make a big change in our ability to successfully petition for um, speed limit changes on a lot of our roadways. Um, hey, Logan, I think this is Rob. Can I, can I jump in on this? Go ahead. Sec? Yeah, please do. Sure. Hi, I'm Rob Innerfeld. I'm the transportation planning manager for the city. So to just um, clarify a little bit of what Logan was saying, there's kind of two things that are happening. So so streets like, like the residential streets that became 20, they're set through what's called a statutory speed limit, where, this, where it's set by rule, like a certain speed. But then busier streets are set, like Logan said, they're set through speed studies. Recently, the Oregon Department of Transportation, known as ODOT, they changed 
how the speeds are set on those streets to use to look more at local context. And it'll it'll enable the city to lower speeds on a lot of streets in Eugene. However, ODOT is still in control of setting those speed limits. And it can be an arduous process for us to ask them for every street we'd like to see the speed limit lowered. It's an arduous process for us to ask them one street at a time. So there's actually a bill in the legislature right now. Unfortunately, I don't have the number, the bill number at the tip of my fingers, but it's actually the omnibus transportation bill. And it'll it will allow ODOT to delegate speed limit setting to cities. So ODOT would create some sort of a program that would enable them to delegate that to us. And then we would be in charge of setting speed limits on city streets and they would just monitor that. So we, what we'd like to do is to wait until that bill passes, which is we, we're very confident it will pass. And, um, and then, then we will begin working more on looking at speed limits around Eugene, probably focusing on our vision zero high crash network first and looking at are the speed limits appropriate or not. And that's, does that answer the question? Okay, I'll hand it back to Logan. Oh yeah, that's, that's super helpful additional context. Um, yeah, I think, I think that, let's see. Yeah, I think that probably covers the question. Yeah. Um, looks like there's a next one. Uh, do we want to continue down the list? Yeah. Besides the signage, how are Eugene drivers at large expected to understand that the local streets are now all 20 miles per hour? As mentioned, some streets have fewer little speed limit signs to start with. Yeah, well, um, the, 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 the speed limit signs themselves um, are the best option, to be honest with you. Uh, as I mentioned, there was a pretty robust community outreach campaign to try uh, alerting drivers and bringing attention to the fact that the speed limit signs were in fact changing. Um, as I mentioned, you know, there's the yard sign campaign, radio ads, social media ads. Um, there, there were certainly some news releases. Um, and, uh, you know, to be honest with you, I think it's possible that there are some people who, you know, just by virtue of the fact that they didn't, you know, uh, happen upon that particular ad or they haven't really looked at the yard signs, perhaps just hasn't noticed that the, the speed limit has changed on their local street. And that's something that I think over time with exposure, more people will notice um, since this is such a large scale change at the citywide level. Um, I think that uh, repeated exposure to 20 mile per hour signs on these types of residential streets will kind of um, settle into to the subconscious of drivers, um, at least hopefully. Uh, the next question, can you clarify like within FAN, what are some of the streets that are not local streets? I didn't write that very well, but yeah, uh, I can get an idea. I can share my screen. I have, a, I have my mapping software up right now. This might be helpful. Um, so, most of FAN's streets are local streets. Actually, uh, can you see my screen before I continue talking? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, so this is just, uh, this is my mapping software. I just have it open for my own personal reference, but I don't mind showing it to you all. Um, so in purple, I've highlighted the streets that were local streets, uh, that are local streets that were 25 miles per hour prior to this project. And then there's also a handful of locations highlighted in pink that before this project actually were local streets with 20 mile per hour uh, speed limits. Um, so as you can see, a, a large portion of fan streets are um, local and the streets that aren't local, they're generally collectors like Polk, 24th, uh, you know, Lincoln here. Um, so hopefully this is, this is a helpful clarification. Um, and once again, this is just a map of um, the functional classification overlaid with, with the speed, the prior speed limit to the project. Um, this is not factoring in where we have speed limit signs currently. So just because a street is highlighted in purple doesn't mean that um, you're going to see a 20 mile per hour uh, speed limit signs sort of, you know, there, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, kind of in follow up to that question was what about the residential part of chambers, but looks like chambers on either side is. Yeah, chambers is, is a collector. Um, so, or actually, excuse me, uh, chambers is a minor arterial. So that's definitely not something that we can touch um, with 
this particular uh, speed limit change uh, process. So are there other questions? Well, thank you very much, Logan. This was really helpful. And I think you're right that it's that constancy of seeing these signs over and over and over again, and, and then getting used to how, how it feels to drive 20 miles an hour. I mean, you know, it's, now I find myself driving slower in lots of places. Um, hey, Margie, this is Todd. You want me to uh, pick up the agenda from here? Go for it. Thank you so much. Well, thank you to our uh, city staff and the presentations this evening. It's greatly appreciated. It's nice to have, uh, for me at least, it's nice to have this transportation focus uh, meeting. There are some other things. I think we have a little bit of time left um, in the uh, in the meeting here. Oh, it's eight oh six. We got we got some good time. Yep. Um, so there are some other city projects that are uh, going on. Um, it related to the friendly area neighbors um, neighborhood. And I'd like to invite city staff to just talk about those a little bit, uh, not formal presentations, but just give us the update on what's happening there, what we can expect and, and open up for some more questions and answers. Um, the first one is Jefferson Street. I'm a Jefferson Street resident um, and I've been working with Logan and a bunch of other city staff for a number of uh, years on uh, speed on Jefferson. As we saw from Logan's map, Jefferson Street is a, is a collector. Uh, it's not part of the 20 is plenty campaign that will get that lower speed limit. It's marked at 25 miles an hour. And those of us that live on Jefferson agree that 25 miles an hour is a very reasonable um, speed, plenty adequately slow. Unfortunately, most people don't drive anywhere near 25 miles an hour on Jefferson, which makes it uh, inherently dangerous. Um, so through a separate process, the city was able to um, study that and qualify it and address traffic calming, which is uh, coming, still coming in 2021. So that's the first thing I think I want uh, probably Logan to, uh, to discuss or unless there's another city staff person that would like to bring that on. And then, and then maybe segue into Central Eugene in motion, which affects the Midtown area. Uh, and that's a segue off of the earlier presentation on Willamette Street and talk a little bit uh, more to the north on Willamette Street up towards uh, Midtown, now the Southtown area. So um, I guess, Logan, do you want to take that? Yep. Um, so the Jefferson Street traffic calming project, uh, for anyone who isn't familiar, um, is all about uh, slowing speeds on Jefferson Street using uh, speed cushions. Uh, speed humps is another way of, of putting that. Um, additionally, so, so the speed hump portion of the project is going to include uh, 18 uh, different uh, locations, uh, approximately one speed uh, cushion per block. Um, and then the sort of second portion of the project uh, is we're considering um, including some additional enhanced crossings and, and bundling that in with construction. So some of you uh, may be familiar with the fact that we've collected pedestrian uh, video data uh, at three intersections on Jefferson Street, uh, Jefferson and 20th, 20th uh, Jefferson and 24th, and Jefferson and 27th. Uh, some of you may have even seen me up on a ladder fiddling with the pole in a, in a weird looking camera. Um, so we collected that data and we're sending it off to um, a company called uh, SPAC Solutions and they uh, process that for us. So they're going to get back to us with a count of how many pedestrians are crossing at those locations at which legs of the crosswalk. Um, and that's going to help us uh, run these locations through sort of uh, or compare them to our crosswalk guidance and see um, you know, how, how, how much is, how, how many people are really uh, crossing at these locations? What does the demand look like? Um, and, and the great thing with having this video data is that I don't just have to go and pick a three hour window to camp out there. You know, we get the full 24 hours. So if there's a time of day that's you know, most busy, I'm gonna be able to see that and we can use that information um, to sort of uh, highlight the, the peak demand, pedestrian crossing demand of the area. Um, so uh, that is something that is underway. Um, now this project, another update um, since the last time I spoke to you all about this, is that this project, um, we've made the decision to bundle this in with uh, a paving project that's going in on Lincoln Street. Um, so we're going to put these out to bid together um, and it's gonna go out to bid in March, um, it's anticipated to. 
Um, and then the idea would be that construction begins in mid-May. Um, now, when I say construction begins in mid-May, um, that's construction on this whole Lincoln Jefferson uh, merged construction project. Uh, it, after speaking with uh, the engine, the primary engineer on the project, it sounds like it would be pretty likely if they'd start on Lincoln and then move to Jefferson. Um, but that being said, it's certainly um, you know work on the on the dual sort of construction is going to begin in May and then um, be wrapped up within the construction season. So I think I think I covered all the updates on Jefferson. Rob, okay. Rob you're just, popping up on my screen. Are you are you um, trying to jump in? No, sorry. I was gonna be ready to talk about Willamette Street oh, okay. in the northern part when okay. when people are ready. Uh, thanks, Rob. I'm just checking the um, the chat to see if there's some questions here. Uh, looks like it's still related to. Um, Well, I think there's one question here from Billy related to the, the crosswalk. Um, it says, has Eugene considered foregoing the requirement of collecting pedestrian crossing data before improving a crossing? Seattle did this and has found that enhanced crosswalks can be built uh, and then will become a, I don't understand, will come scenario. Anyway, there's a, there's a link there. But I think the question is, um, is there a way that you can get it? Uh, qualify, I guess, enhanced crosswalks without collecting pedestrian crossing data? Well, I would, well, first and foremost, I would need to read into the details of the Seattle um, project you're referencing. I'm not familiar with it, but also, um, you know, the, the thing about um, comparing uh, a crossing location against our crosswalk guidance is that uh, you know the city has uh, a limited amount of maintenance resources, um, so I think prioritizing. I think that you know putting in some you know standards and some degree of threshold for where we put in um, things like mark crosswalks, you know uh, curb extensions, you know things of that nature. Making sure that we're getting the highest um, need locations really helps us you know stretch our resources further. Um, you know, so I, I, I hear what you're saying and I, and I hear, you know, the sentiment that, you know, more pedestrian crossing safety is, is good, you know, regardless of, you know, anything else. I, I, I hear that, but also I, I, I'm trying to be cognizant of sort of the, re, the real maintenance constraints, constraints that are taking place um, over at uh, Public Works Maintenance. Also, Logan, I'm, I might have missed this, but did you talk about why we're doing temporary bump outs rather than permanent? Uh, no, I did not. So uh, I can I can jump in on that. Um, sure. okay. So the so when when I say temporary curb extensions, um, some of you may be able to picture this, but I'm talking about those those flexible delineators, those those flexible plastic uh, pole looking things um, that you often see like blocking off something like a bike lane. Um, so so using that to um, sort of create at the corners of the intersection a bulb out to reduce the crossing distance that pedestrians um, have as they move from one side of Jefferson to the other. And this reduces their exposure. And the reason that um, you know, we're, we're pursuing uh, this concept with flexible delineators opposed to concrete is A, um, flexible delineators um, are, you know, they're relatively affordable in comparison to con concrete, but B, um, you know, Jefferson Street is uh, in our TSP listed as, uh, uh, you know, a street that's supposed to receive uh, bike lanes in the future. It's, it's currently on our 20 plus year list, um, but it is something that is um, within the TSP. Um, so creating uh, the, flexible the flexible delineator based curb extensions increases our flexibility to um, sort of repurpose that space and remove that barrier uh, for bikes in the future um, when uh, a bike lane is installed. You know, I glanced at the article that someone posted in the chat and we, we've, we are, I would say we are moving away from, and we've never, I don't know that we ever really had a really strict, like you have to have a certain number of pedestrians crossing somewhere to have, um, of Mark Crosswalk, um, but we've definitely been moving more towards having a system 
approach to having crosswalks like on certain streets at every few blocks there should be a, a crosswalk but sometimes the question is like i think i think part of the reason logan is doing this data collection is we didn't know which cross, we weren't going to mark every single intersection so we had to decide well which ones have the highest pedestrian crossing demand and but maybe well i don't remember if we picked a number but if say we were, we were going to mark three in a 10 block section how do we know which three to mark so that's we look Often we'll look at like the network, like the and what are the destinations nearby, like schools, which we already have a crosswalk for Adams, and but at different destinations and try to line them up. But I think we didn't. There, it wasn't really obvious to us which rose to the top for Jefferson Street, and so we wanted to get to look at the data to get a, a better handle on maybe where the greatest demand was. Thanks, Rob. I want to. Um, there's one more sort of question or comment before we go into Central Eugene in motion, and, and that is uh, build it and they will come in reference to pedestrian crosswalks. I think the sentiment is here in terms of that other question too about the data collection. You know, if you're looking to where are you going to build a bridge across the river, right? This is the story I've heard. It's like, well, you go to the river and see how many cars are trying to cross where there's no bridge. Well, obviously not, right? So you'll, you'll never qualify to get the bridge there. Um, but uh, I, I do appreciate um, the input and the logic behind what you're saying. And I do want to uh, add for the rest of the neighborhood here that we collaborated with the city when they were looking at the crosswalk locations for um, the enhanced marking for Jefferson Street. And through the transportation team, we were able to get a survey out uh, to uh, Jefferson Street uh, area neighbors that we had a list of and, and put that out and get some pretty quick feedback, at least from a larger pool of people, where kind of like crowdsourcing, where did they think pedestrian, what, which streets were, were important? We fed that back to Logan, so then he could do the, the data study on those intersections to see if it, if it made sense as well. Um, so with that, I wanna move on to uh, take advantage of the time that we do have left. We got a little bit less than 15 minutes here, about 10 minutes, uh, Rob, to talk about Central Eugene in Motion. Okay, great. So Central Eugene in Motion was a planning study where we looked at three different areas in the greater central Eugene area where we had been thinking about redesigning the street network and it was more efficient to bring people together through one public involvement process. And the, the area that was most pertinent to your neighborhood is looking at making Willamette two way between 18th and, and 20th avenues, which I'm sure people are very familiar with the fact that it's been one way for a long time and over the years, we would we did do a planning process around 10, 12 years ago, and the outcome of that was to keep it one way, but we would still continually hear from people who were like, why is this not two way? And so we decided to do another traffic study, look at it um, a little more broadly. And we ultimately, we went through this process and decided to, that to go ahead and make it two way. Um, we worked closely with the property owners and businesses in the area. One, a couple of concessions we made to the businesses, or one in particular, was to keep the parking on Willamette Street next to the Meridian Shopping Center. That was a major concern of theirs. That was that if we had, we did, we were unable to put create enough space within the street to put in a left turn pocket northbound there. So for people who want to turn left on 18th, they will still need to go over to Oak Street. But if you want to go straight north on Willamette at 18th, you can go, you can continue north on Willamette. Otherwise, you can take a right on, on 20th or 19th and then make a left on Oak. So the major elements of this project are, like I said, making Willamette two-way from 18th to 20th. We're also making 20th two-way from Willamette to Oak and Oak two-way from 20th to 19th. And we will be installing an all-way stop sign at 20th and Oak. Um, We'll also be doing some street repaving work. We're gonna be putting a brand new traffic signal at 18th and Willamette. And we will be installing bike lanes in each direction and some of which will be protected. Uh, I think those are the, also the inter, some of the intersections will have um, protection for bikes at the intersections of 19th and 20th on the east side. So that we're concerned about cars turning right and what, what would be called a right hook type of crash. So we're actually pulling the bike lane back from the intersection a bit so drivers have more time to see bike riders and so that they see them more um, straight on rather than over their shoulder. Um, so those are, there's some design treatments we're doing to try to make those intersections safer for people riding bikes. We'll also be putting new sidewalk access ramps or curb ramps in at, at several of the, inter, the intersections as well. And we're getting ready to put that contract out to bid and we're hoping to begin work in April and then we'll continue through the summer. 
there, there will be there will be curb ramps at every intersection. Yes, I believe at all four corners of every intersection. To answer the question that was just posted there, let's see. Um, I'm, I'm just reading what's in the chat. If Brian is still here, maybe he could take a look at that. But I believe we will be putting in curb ramps at every corner. I've seen the designs. I believe that's what I've seen. So I, I don't. I haven't seen anything that would would contradict that. You know. Eugene actually has a really good reputation for curb ramps and I know you may see some in town and, and be like why did they design it that way but it's it's really really complicated it takes a lot of engineering work um, we do um, more probably than any jurisdiction in the state in terms of just rebuilding curb ramps we've been really good about doing as many as we can in our paving projects the, um, other other agencies including ODOT have gotten sued because they haven't kept up with improving their curb ramps and I would say that the, the way we design them has evolved over time as we've learned more about how to do a good job of designing them. And sometimes there's sort of, con there's conflicting goals we're trying to reach at the same time when we're designing a curb ramp. Um, so I'll just leave it, leave it at that. Are there any more questions about that particular project? Rob, I see there's one um, ahead of that that I don't think got answered. Oh, okay. Will there be a northbound bike lane also on Willamette Pass Meridian? Yes. There, we will have a complete bike lane network on Willamette Street once this project is built. Oh, north, including north, uh, yes, it will be there. There will be bike lanes the whole way on Willamette. If you, if you would like. Uh, I have a question I'd like to interject here. It takes me, it takes, this is Carlos speaking. It, it takes a little while to get words in, into the chat section. And so I'd just like to throw this in here, to, uh, in particular to, uh, Jason Miller, if he's still there, uh, in terms of the choosing the trees for Willamette Street, I'm concerned that the trees being next to the bike lane, if they're gonna be dropping leaves into the bike lane in the fall, then that's gonna create a hazard for bicyclists because wet leaves are extremely slippery. And I'm just wondering if, uh, it, if it might be better to consider safety rather than availability of trees for that project? Um, yeah, I mean, that's, um, I mean, with trees come leaves. And so that's kind of um, the position that you're in um, with the bike lane. I, I mean, I know the city has a maintenance cycle with in terms of removing the leaves. Um, I think the, the trees that we've chosen, you know, some of them lose all their leaves at the same time, but um, I don't think there's anything we can completely do to 100% keep leaves out of the bike lane. Um, I mean, we'll, I can certainly voice, talk to our urban forestry staff more about that as we're choosing, making our final tree selections on that. But uh, I, uh, with trees, I think we're just kind of stuck with leaves and just as long as they're not, as long as they're removed with a reasonable maintenance cycle, it seems like that would be the best approach at this point. The city has an app called iBike Huge that's available both for iPhones and Androids. And it, when and probably the most popular thing it's used for is people to report leaves and bike lanes. And we were really responsive, I believe, at getting they go right into our maintenance management system when those requests are put in. So I encourage people to get that get that app. Well, thanks. On, on my part, um, you know, we only have a few minutes left, so I want to turn it back over to the, the chairs um, and, and close out with any final discussion or, or comments they might have uh, for the meeting. You're muted, Margie. Um, I see Billy has a question about a rough idea about completion date. I'm thinking of the central Eugene. Rob, you're muted. Sorry, I was trying to put the app information in. Um, so the completion date for, I mean, all I would know is midsummer is what we're, that's what it says on our website. So I don't know exactly, you know, it's hard to know exactly, but, and Todd, I mean, I could, if you want, I could briefly speak to the other central Eugene and motion projects, but they're not in the friendly area neighborhood. So, but I could give like a 30 seconds on each if you'd like. We're getting pretty close to the end. That's fine. So, yeah. But thank you. Oh, no I want to 
thank all the city staff who came that you're sharing your evening with us because I think it was really helpful to um, have this information. And I know within FAN, our transportation team is very active and it's great to give them opportunity to share things that they've been working on and, um, and letting all of us know about them. So um, thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it. And thank you all, everybody for coming. You know, it's, a, it's always good to see folks together and, and interested in what's going on. And we encourage you to visit our website, uh, friendlyareaneighbors.org if you want to get involved in various um, other activities and see what's going on. So thank you again very much and have a good rest of your evening.